This is an episode from a podcast of Biblical Proportions. You can find us wherever you're listening to podcasts. Hello everybody and welcome to a podcast of Biblical Proportions. Episode 1, The Nature of God, The Creation Story, Part A. The Bible is the number one best-selling book ever. And the Bible's creation story might well be the most well-known and iconic story ever told by humans. How influential has it been? Well, while we count years and months and days according to the sun and the moon, this particular story is to blame for the seven-day week. The first seven words of the Bible are probably the most famous part of the whole book. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. This is the beginning of the story and the beginning of our podcast. A creation story might be the most critical part of any story or character. Think of the origin story of Captain America. Think of Jesus' creation story. Think of the Joker movie and how that movie sheds new light on a character we know well. Hi, Omri Arel. Hi. I am Gil Kidron. So for this podcast, we're going to use the original Hebrew text, the final Hebrew text, because it, it has been yeah, edited, it was also and, edited yeah. Yeah, edited and redacted several times. But the final Hebrew text, I'm going to contrast it with the King James uh, Bible version from 1611 England. So two different worlds. Are you ready for a recap? Yes. So for those of us who don't remember the story, God created the world in six days. First, he turned on the light. Then he created the sky and the earth and the seas, the vegetations and the animals. And on the sixth day, he created humans, a male and a female. On the seventh day, the Sabbath, the Shabbat, he rested. The thing that I like most about this story, it's something that I find truly original and kind of groundbreaking slash revolutionary. The fact that the God creates the world, the universe, as we imagine it, his action is not like raising a hand or like a, a very strong and muscly action. It's using a word. And it's, I find it quite amazing that the people who wrote and told that story, probably uh, like in the 9th or 8th uh, century BC, it's quite an old story. They had this intuitive understanding about the power of language and kind of what makes us human the fact that we can use words to describe to name it's like some kind of a secret power that other animals other beings don't have to create something with words to say the action is to say it's quite cool for me the first thing that comes to mind to me when i'm reading this story is how powerful it is how dramatic and engaging like the moment i, re I read the first lines in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. I'm like, ooh, I'm sitting up. Some of our, the misconceptions of this creation story is the fact that the creation is something out of nothing. Yeah. This creation story doesn't even talk about nothing that <laughs> has to do with nothingness. There is no nothingness. There is no concept of nothingness. When they say you void, they don't imagine complete darkness. Maybe some of them do it's more likely that they imagine some kind of a fog. They don't imagine stars in space. It's more probable that they imagine vast oceans, unending sea, blue in the waters and blue in the sky. Mm. So it, it, and now imagine in your own imagination the creation story. At first there was chaos and then there was light. So immediately you imagine the Big Bang. You, mean, you imagine a dark black void Mm -hmm. some sort of a let it be light and suddenly there's light and there's the explosion of stars we all seen this uh, these movies we all seen this cosmos light. there's no cosmos there <laughs> <laughs> the stars are not even objects far far away they're just lights yes so part of the distortion and, and of the changes uh, in in the way that we perceive the story uh, contrasting to how they were telling their own story obviously stems from the translations and for example in the King James Bible God created the heaven and the earth the earth that's planet mm -hmm. earth and the heaven that's something uh, mystical metaphysical in the actual uh, version Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim ve ha-aretz the sky it's not the heaven it's the sky and it's not even the earth it's the land Haaretz. This is the land like Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, like the surface that you are standing on. 
those people probably didn't we can see here that they didn't even imagine it was nothingness because it says like he, he created the heaven and the earth god's spirit floats upon the water so there was okay. already water, water there like for them nothingness is probably water unending waters like a vast oceans or uh -huh. seas because when they describe nothingness it's more like god put order in some kind of a pre-existent chaos that was already there okay i want to contrast uh, to your point uh, the power of language let's say with a couple of hindu creation stories brahma had this idea this notion that he was alone and then he was separated into a male and female this also uh, sheds light on the on the hindu way of thinking throughout the ages from which later were born uh, buddhism and uh, all kinds of other local uh, local religions so here it's very abstract and maybe this is the reason that it survives to this day because you can apply it to wherever you are and whenever you are and bring in your own imagination into it and it works mm -hmm. the story works here the dramatic effect of the story is not personified yeah. by a character yes it's quite revolutionary to demand from the audience imagine the unimaginable you know what i mean yeah in the english translation it says the spirit of god floats above the water in hebrew the word for spirit and wind are the same it's the same word it's more probable to me that when they said spirit of god ruach elohim they probably said the wind of god so even here does it it's some kind of abstractification abstract abstractification if this, this word exists of the god because yeah it's because not the wind is also abstract. wind yeah wind is like the it's, it's the most abstract in, <laughs> in the world yeah it's like the limits of the abstract that you can imagine <laughs> even back then you know it exists it moves but it's transparent so <laughs> so a transparent god it's some kind of a revolutionary cognitive uh, thing to me because up till now people imagine gods as some, some kind of people they know or they can imagine extrapolate their muscle their their, their size whatever and now they say no the deity that you need to work and you need to uh, worship the deity is transparent invisible and not only invisible in your day-to-day -day life for example uh, some indian dude in uh, 1000 bc asked his priest uh, where is shiva and he said oh you can't see shiva but he's there in this other realm olympus heaven later whatever right if you can make this cognitive jump from only imagining higher beings that look like you but different to a higher beings that don't have any face it's kind of a con cognitive jump <laughs> yeah. and so but so pr this is probably why people don't worship atman mm -hmm. they have the other gods yes shiva vishnu faces and stories so you have that so atman like the self that's the only thing that existed in the beginning what is that you can't imagine it and from and from that the the atman he created the the earth the sky the heavens and then there's water that combination makes uh, makes uh, Hinduism uh, not as easy to travel to other places where you don't have these specific stories of these specific gods. Here in this story, in the in the first creation story, he can travel very very well. You and can live in Kansas and believe in it, and that's fine. And this god doesn't even have a name. The word for god is El, a god in Hebrew, which was a god in the Canaanite uh, pantheon. Mm. There was a god named El. It's a common phenomenon that a name that is given to describe something becomes the name of yes. the thing. So it's like fridge. I think that's also like a company. Yes. And that became like the word. The In Israel, word. we had a, a semi-socialist economy for uh, about uh, 40 years in, in the beginning of uh, our country. We didn't uh, import a lot of cars. So the word for a four wheel drive for us is Jeep. We say Jeep, right. even a hammer, which is a different company. Hammer. Hammer. We call it Jeep. Right. So it's the same thing. There was a, a yes. God named El, and the plural for this word is Elohim or Elim, Elohim. Gods. It's gods, basically. There's an archaeological remnant of some way of thinking that the forces of nature that control us has to be plural. We have to remember that those people lived in a polytheistic context which means that their surroundings believed in other gods. So it doesn't necessarily mean 
that that deny the existence of other gods it's just that they worship only one god out of those a jealous god that doesn't want you to worship those others but it's not that they don't exist yeah because that was the only way of thinking that existed at the time of the writing of the text so it's not a monotheistic religion where you don't believe other gods exist it's blasphemy but it is some kind of a proto monotheistic religion by the fact that they do worship only one god and they attribute the creation of the world to this god so there's even a word for it i believe i don't remember the word right now so it's some kind of a monotheistic it's worship of only one god while not denying the existence of the existence of others unlike the second story God there has a name in your translation in the King James Bible translation from the 17th century like uh, in England in England 3000 years in a, another galaxy far far wow, away wow 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 they translated God's name as the Lord but in the original Hebrew text it's a name it's Elohim Yehovah Yahweh uh, Yahweh uh, Jehovah but here it's not even here that. it's not here it's only God and scholars believe there's different sources of writing in the Bible itself from different, uh, from different people in different times. Here Elohim represent a different group of writers that came from an, another time and another place than the people who wrote the second story. Yeah. And their God is God Yahweh. It has a name. So the fact that they had these two stories, the second story worked better because you could imagine it and you had the, this character that you knew. But then later on, when this story began to travel to other places, the first story became more popular and more, and more relatable. Yes, and that only goes to show that to think in abstract ways, it's much more universal. Mm -hmm. In different times, in different places, people can project their own thoughts and their own imaginations into those stories. So an evangelistic priest, he imagines whether he wants it or not, uh, Carl Sagan's cosmos reenactions of the Big Bang. The imaginary world yes. that builds your consciousness, your ego in the Freudian sense, not your ego in the, yeah. you know, the macho sense. The way that you see the world and the way you imagine the world with the yeah. words that comes to your mind are, are limited. Today, we can use, you know, uh, folders as uh, whatever symbolism or algorithm and stuff like that, because this is because we live in a computerized world. But if we try to imagine how people 1000 years in the future, how they will experience uh, their existence, whatever it is, it is impossible. And when they will read our stories 1000 years in the future, they will have to work very, very hard to understand the limits of our own imagination here. You have to walk and we sweat and we have to go to the bathroom and we can't just travel to some other galaxy just like that. And we can't change ourselves. We have a, we have flesh. <laughs> we make babies in the in the stomach <laughs> in, the, in the stomach. So, for example, when uh, in a lot of uh, sci-fi movies, when, when a new being is created, it still has to go through the magic of the womb, something that we can't recreate, we can't fully understand. In the Alien, uh, second Alien movie, and uh, I have other movies uh, that I don't remember the name, it has to go through impregnation because this is the limit of our imagination. Exactly, and when we tell a story that it uh, occurs like 2,000 years in the future, we have to tell that story through humans. The beings that will be 2000 years in the future from now won't be human at all. They will shit from their fingers, you know, <laughs> they won't have any sex or whatever. They will live in some kind of virtual. But our imagination even now is completely limited. So take it back to the story. Their limited imagination didn't have images of space, didn't have uh, day to day modern city life science education blah 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 they didn't have it they had only their whatever farm town uh, stories from merchants or whatever and in the next line let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters so basically in the mind the primitive mind of those guys the skies and the seas are the same 
and it's pretty reasonable when you look at it. Yeah. The, waters uh, and waters. Waters come down from the skies. Your existence is dependent upon the amount of water that comes out of the sky. And they change colors this, at the same time, which is pretty suspicious. When the sky are dark, the waters are dark. <laughs> and when the sky is, are blue, the waters are blue. And so they probably are the same thing. In Hebrew, yeah. the word for water is maim. Maim. Like a maim. Uh, Marcel Merceau. Marcel Merceau. Like a maim. The word for sky is sham maim. <laughs> sham <laughs> means there. So imagine yes. you have close water, you have far water, sky, and you have sky over there. You have waters. <laughs> Waters over there. God didn't create water in this creation story. He just made a difference between water above and water below. God's action here is naming, giving order, not creating. It's not something out of nothing. The sky and the earth is something that is constant in their reality. It's something that is always there. Mm. It's like the base. Mm -hmm. So the action here is to divide between identical objects or things you know so again it's not a creation story <laughs> it's a story of uh, rearranging it's a decoration story yeah, exactly <laughs> like you lived uh, for a long time whatever in chaos <laughs> in your apartment and now you're just like rearranging stuff and uh, you know this is not gonna call this a sofa <laughs> and also when god creates uh, the the big light and names it uh, sun the hebrew word is shemesh mm -hmm. And that's similar to the sun god in the Akkadian uh, mythology, Shamsh, Shamsh, something uh, of that sort that was yeah. the sun god. Yeah, Shamsh, Shamsh, Shush. <laughs> yes, there are or no Shemesh. vowels uh, in the Semitic languages. Yeah, I think the way that uh, language works is uh, the more ancient it is, it has more consonant in it. Consonant. Consonant in it it is much more harder to pronounce so probably the higher classes will uh, pronounce it like the most uh, in the best way maybe it's like something of <laughs> <laughs> it's more like a sound and later when it comes to the lower classes uh, in society it became it the vowels become much more free so maybe it's like more <laughs> so so the point is to all, to all this point about about the the creation story as god didn't create everything out of nothing mm -hmm. there was a base there was a base he rearranged it he gave it names its own names the same goes with the creation story and with the bible they didn't create it out of nothing mm -hmm. they had the base of uh, shams mm -hmm. other gods tovavo yam yam also in the in Gilgamesh it says in the Gilgamesh tales it says that the world was created in six days so they uh, they had the base they rearranged it they gave it different names and on top of that they started to create things out of nothing mm -hmm. maybe there's some kind of an element I'm not sure if I totally believe it but maybe there's some kind of an element of reclamation of reclamation of the story appropriation of the story like uh, beings that were once deities like Yam and Shamsh and Shemesh are now just things that mm. exist in the creation of Elohim. Yes, gods. Yeah. That our, that our God created. Yeah, exactly. It could be. It could be. It's more of an interpretation. I think it's more the fact that uh, it's some kind of a remnant of a period when an object was a deity. So the word for sun was not only a word to describe the sun, mm -hmm. it's a word that was given to the sun god. Yes. The sun uh, is a god. Yes, yes, yes. So yes, when yes. you call the sun, sun, you're basically naming a god. So I think it's more like that. It was the sh Shemesh Shamsh, the god of sun and the sun. Yes, the same thing. And it's one when the they same. stopped believed, believing in the god, yes. as... as all gods know once you stop believing them they just disappeared <laughs> yes but the sun stayed the sun stayed because you can see, still see the sun so speaking of uh, shemesh shamsh shamash shamash mm -hmm. we still use that word today to describe the the bigger candle in the hanukkah yeah. hanukkah yeah 
the festival of lights yeah okay so it still uh, retains uh, this pronunciation shamash yeah and shamash is also some kind of a maitre d of the of the synagogue mm. is the guy that uh, arranges wow. the seats or something i'm t- i'm not a religious uh, person <laughs> so if you, there's jews in the audience uh, feel free to uh, to correct us to f- make fun of me it's important to note that uh, the animals and the grass and other specific stuff God did create out of nothing. So unlike a regular conflict from many stories that we know, which you know you have a, a character, a human character with, mo- with motivations, with some kind of a, an obstacle in his or her life, here the conflict is you have a mess, you have chaos, so the conflict is to make order out of that mess. Okay, so let's wrap up our first episode in this podcast. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We discussed uh, the, the nature of this uh, deity, of this God that is uh, universal for its time. Abstract. Abstract. And, ha- and he created, reorganized the world through his speech, mm-hmm. which is uh, very distinct and also inform- original and very original and also can inform you of the success of uh, the people who were whatever the descendants of the story aka the jews and in the next episode we want to go through the creation story and see how the world was actually organized and created and after that we'll go through the second creation story a story written by different people in a different place attached to this one and it's a very forgettable story different imagination also. different imagination different characters so stick around for that so if you enjoyed this episode uh, be sure to follow us wherever you're catching this it could be uh, the apple podcast spotify we're on several platforms uh, and maybe you can give us a review and rank us this help other people discover this podcast we're just starting out We want to do it for ever and ever and ever. There are so many really, really cool stories to tell. We're going to go through the book story by story. With this kind of thinking, reading the actual text in its actual context and contrasting that to how we remember it today and how that also informs us on the story because we can look from uh, from the outside and uh, have this uh, Martian perspective. And if you know uh, of other people who you, you think uh, would be interested in this podcast, then uh, maybe you can uh, send them a link and, or uh, post on your social media. Anything will help. We'll appreciate it very, very much. So thank you, everybody. And we'll see you all in the next episode that breaks down how the world is created and organized. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.